Give it up for Very Natural, please. I want to thank you all for coming. My name is Rudy. I'm the CEO of Verde. We're very, very excited to have you all here. The idea behind this series of meetups um, is to try to create a strong community of living soil cultivators. I see two types of growers in this industry, people that care to honor the plant and other people that just want to get the most out of the plant that they can for themselves. So for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to host something like this. For that, thank you so much for coming. We'll be having events like this once a month now for this year. Um, and we'll try our best to be available for you in any way we can. And also to learn from you about your experiences in your own cultivation gardens. So thank you so much and please give it up for Jeff Lowenfels that doesn't need any intro. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, I guess you can. Uh, you know, I was here a couple of, what, two months ago, I guess, and this guy comes up to me, Jamie. I didn't know him. And he says, you know, we got to grow around here, down the street here. We'd like you to come soil grow. Mm -hmm. ah. You know, nah, I don't, normally I don't do this kind of stuff, you know, but I did. And I was so glad I did because your facility was phenomenal, your attitude is phenomenal, and it just shows Verity putting this together. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and, and really everybody here, uh, I think, uh, appreciates what you've done. So thank you. We're going to talk about the soil food web. We're going to talk about uh, uh, growing organic cannabis. And I'm going to be offensive in, occasionally, but I apologize in advance. Many of you know I wrote Teaming with Microbes. Uh, the gentleman, Wayne Lewis, is, was, is, is my business partner. Um, I'm not sure Wayne's read the book, uh, but he answered the telephone and did all the business work while I wrote the book. So uh, uh, and he's a great guy. Uh, Teaming with Nutrients was, was the second book. The first book, Teaming with Microbes, is, is sort of how the food gets to the plant. The second book, Teaming with Nutrients, is how the food gets into the plant and what happens to it once it gets into the plant. And then uh, I just came out with this book uh, at the beginning of the year called Teaming with Fungi, or last year, I guess. Uh, and this is another way that uh, food gets into the plant. So now that I have a trilogy uh, of plants, uh, books, I call myself Lord of the Roots. Um, and if you don't get the feeling that this is going to be a little humorous talk, you, you know, you, you should get that feeling. Um, I'm an old guy. I'm 68 years old. I'm almost 69 years old. Uh, when I was a kid, aluminum foil appeared out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, we had things like Jiffy Pop, uh, plastic. Out of nowhere, people started eating off of plastic. Uh, people started eating plastic. Uh, for those who heard the story this morning about the margarine package, that's me on the margarine package. Um, <laughs> and, and, and for those who didn't hear the story, I will just simply quickly summarize it by saying the founder of miracle Grow worked for my parents at a butter company, my father and grandfather, and put my picture on this package. <laughs> and so when I tell people miracle Grow is not a great product, don't buy it, you know, normally they'd sue somebody saying something like that, but come and get me because you did this to me. Uh, <laughs> I think the jury will be on my side. At the same time, all these new fertilizers started to appear out of nowhere, and you know, commercials and magazines and all sorts of stuff. We had a lot of gardening magazines. Newer, better, easier, and we learned how to spray our food because nobody wanted to have blemishes on their apples. Instant coffee. You cannot imagine what that was like to have happen. And every Wednesday night, my brothers and I would watch at 6 o'clock Mr. Wizard, who would talk about chemistry and better living through chemistry, which was the name of the television show sponsors, you know, better living through chemistry. Mr. Wizard, there he is, and his little dweeby assistant who, you know, took chemistry a little too seriously as she grew up, uh, and uh, that was kind of fun. We had no varied lighting. You always knew somebody that was growing plants because the lights were purple. You could see them down the block. Uh, you had to hide where you were growing your cannabis, uh, you know, and, and sometimes you forgot where you hid it. Um, and when you finally got, got a crop, uh, you know, you would, you would end up with a crop and you would say, hmm, uh, let's see here, you know, you'd have to rake through the stuff, the sticks and the stones in order to find stuff. And believe it or not, back in the early 60s, a lot of us thought when you just smoked the leaves, you could get stoned out of your mind. Oh my God, the headaches we got. Uh, and, and if you didn't have a degree in chemistry, you basically 
couldn't grow good weed. Simple as that, because everybody was hydroponic and you had to have an advanced degree in chemistry to be able to do it. Well, okay, so now we're to today, there is no Jiffy Pop. This is popcorn, nobody would know what Jiffy Pop is. You guys don't know what it is. TV dinners don't even have aluminum in them. Instant coffee, you don't know what instant coffee is. This is our instant coffee today. Uh, you know, we all have a, 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 you know, a telephone that has in it all the books and magazines we could read, even teeming with microbes on your telephone, my goodness gracious. Uh, you know, we've got television sets in our telephone. And yet, for some reason, when we go into these stores to buy stuff to grow cannabis, what do we discover but an overwhelming abundance of reliance on chemistry? Still, after all of these years. Pretty incredible, particularly when you consider what we're doing. What we're doing is, you know, not just regular growing, we're growing stuff that people are ingesting. And so you know, this reliance on chemistry is bad, really bad. And we all know it. And, and, and we all sit here and worry about the day. I hope we don't worry about the day because I think all of our ethics are probably a little better. But there are growers who worry about the day when their crop goes down, but they can save it with poison. And they do because they'll be good the next time around. But this time, we've got to make the money in order to be able to survive. And they put the poison on it, you know? Well, you know, it doesn't make any difference to me whether you survive or not. If you're giving me poisonous cannabis to ingest into my system, you're doing a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be medical cannabis. Uh, it's supposed to be, you know, good for us. And there's a moral and ethical requirement that we all need to follow, period. And if you lose money, that's not good. We've got some crop insurance we were talking about in the car. Maybe we need to figure out a way we can support each other. But if we end up in an industry where you can use anything you want on it, we're going to end up in an industry that's not going to be a good one to work in. You're not going to want to even grow because you're going to have to use poisons and stuff. It is a bad, bad thing that's happening, and we need to nip this in the bud right away. Some things are so obvious that you really shouldn't have to say it. If your crop goes down, walk away from it. Don't try to sell it to somebody. So what are our goals today? Our goals are to grow the best possible cannabis. You know, we want to grow amazing cannabis. And uh, from my perspective, the way you do that is by using soil and the soil food web. Uh, we need to know a couple of things. We need to know how plants get the nutrients, which again is teeming with microbes. Sorry about the ad. Uh, how plants take up the nutrients uh, and, uh, and how plants use the nutrients. And when you read these three books as a system and put it together, you begin to appreciate what you're working with. And it, and it all begins right here with this diagram. I could give the whole talk on this diagram. Everybody's seen this. This is the soil food web. For those who don't know what a soil food web is, you have all these food chains where the little guy eats the bigger guy, gets eaten by the bigger guy in the soil. Thousands and millions of them. And every now and then something on one chain takes a look up and says, gee, I can eat that thing on that chain up there and does so. And connects the two chains. And eventually you end up with a barb, you know, a chicken wire fence. And you end up with a soil food web instead of food chains. They're all connected. What happens is about 50 to 60% of the energy of the sun goes in to the plant and the plant uses that energy to produce, which you can learn how it does it in teeming with nitrates, uh, nutrients, how it, it produces uh, exudates. And it uses about 60%, as I say, more than half, to drip out things, these exudates, out into the root system. All right? You're all exudating right now as we talk. You're sweating. That's the same exact thing. And in fact, your sweat does the same exact thing as these exudates. What do they do? They attract bacteria, uh-oh, right? Your skin is attracting bacteria, and they attract fungi. And the bacteria and fungi eat the carbon that's in those exudates. The exudates uh, attract tremendous numbers of bacteria and carbon, then I mean, uh, bacteria and fungi, and the bacteria and fungi in turn attract the things that eat them, nematodes and protozoa. The nematodes and protozoa eat the bacteria, they eat the fungi, they do so because they also need carbon, but there's excess. What do you do with excess when you're in a living organism? You poop it out. They happen to do so right there in the rhizosphere, and they end up pooping out this stuff in plant usable form. They take organic molecules, or even organic molecules, and convert them to inorganic molecules that are capable of going into the plant. 
All right, so how does it really work? Let's just, let's just take a look. We've got four cannabis plants sitting out in downtown Denver, uh, you know, on a Friday afternoon, and one of them starts to bitch about the food and says, you know, I'd like a little Mexican or French food today. And the plant next to it, which is a little bigger, says, nah, let's do Japanese. All right, let's do Japanese. And so, so this is the roots of the plants. Uh, you know, they're going down into the soil. And so the plant mixes up the right kind of exudate, drips them out of the root system, and the next thing you know, attracts Japanese bacteria. Okay, so they are the food source for the plant. The plant is in control. If it wanted American food, it changes the exudate mix. So if it wants to get some real good stuff, it just changes the mix and it gets what it needs. The plant is in control. We're gardeners and growers. We like to think we're in control. But if we're smart gardeners and growers, we let the plant be in control. So uh, it's exudates that make the system work. Uh, things sweat. In addition to the bacteria and fungi that are attracted, there are other things in this exudate that we're discovering, new stuff all the time. This is about a year and a half old picture now. These particular exudates that are in this picture coming out of this root are what are known as ex-DNA cells. That's what your white blood cells are. And they do the same thing. They go out into the soil on behalf of the plant and they create poisons that would be going into the plant and prevent them from moving into the soil to the plant. The plant is in control, pretty capable of doing a lot of stuff. Just because we don't know exactly what plants are doing doesn't mean that they're these stationary dumb things, as you all know. Um, all right, so those exudates are designed to attract large populations and diverse populations. And I would leave it at that normally, but just on Thursday, an article came out, I think it was in Science News, that they have done testing now on growing situations all around the world. And what they've discovered is absolutely dumbfounding to me. There are 500 species of bacteria that are in each one of these areas. The same 500 species of bacteria. They can identify them. The list is going to be made available. I was just reading a summary. Uh, so that means, in addition to the diversity, you know, you have a couple of million different kinds of bacterium, but you've got 500 in every grow situation. Do you have those 500 in your cannabis grow? You don't know yet. I don't know yet either because we don't have the list, but we're going to be able to find out. And won't it be a terrific thing to find out, oh my gosh, we're missing 15 or 20 or 30 or 100 of them, and put them back in again so that your plants, unbelievable things are happening all the time. That just happened last week. I had to change uh, the, uh, the slide. So the big 500, this is going to be something we're all going to want to track. And once we know what those big 500 are, then we're going to be able to fool around by adding things that are not in that big 500 and see what they do as well. And, and boy, isn't that going to be fun. So uh, you got this wonderful, big, large, diverse population. But now we know there's a very big core, these 500 species. And so there'll be a lot more on that. Now, why do you want a diverse population? Because diversity is what keeps you safe. If we were a big monoculture, and somebody walks in that's not part of that monoculture, that somebody might be in trouble. You know, so this little guy here, you know, you go, oh my goodness gracious. You don't want to be the only chicken there. Diversity is good. Uh, you know, somebody needs to tell Donald Trump that, but uh, <laughs> that's just sort of the way it goes. So it, it, it's what keeps us safe, um, and in addition to which, these creatures all are doing other things than feeding the plant. They're producing hormones to protect themselves. And so they're killing off some of the bad guys and changing the population mix. And, and all of these things have an impact on how the plant lives. And so they're very, very important. The last thing in the world you want to do is negatively impact uh, the microbes in your soil. So let's start at the bottom. We've got bacteria in a teaspoon of good soil. There's 500 million to a trillion. If you're Verity Natural, you have a trillion. If you're uh, Scott's Miracle Grow Grow, uh, you have 500 million. But, um, uh, so you take these, and they're in that spoon. They're invisible. You, don't, you can't see them. And in addition to that, uh, which is bacteria, uh, th there are archaea, which, which when I wrote the book the first time, uh, the first printing, they weren't even in the book because nobody knew they were in soil. In fact, no, if, if I had put them in there, they would have said the book's a piece of crap because these aren't in soil. 
Well, then they found out that the dominant organism in the oceans, dominant organism in the ocean, and now we find out that the dominant organism in the second step of the nitrogen fixing process, uh, they look just like bacteria. They have a slightly different cell wall. We used to think they only existed in geysers and hot events and those kinds of things, the extremophiles. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, you know, these are the methanogens. So, you know, cows and farts and all that kind of stuff, it's the archaea. Um, and both of these organisms, they eat and eat and eat and breed and breed and breed. And what they eat are simple to digest things. They nibble off the edges of long, complex carbon chains. Uh, they can, just the edges. They can't really break up stuff the way that other organisms can. So they're just nibbling around the edges uh, and they breed like crazy. You take two of them and you put them in a petri dish that's under ideal conditions and you cover the earth in six weeks with, you know, bacterium 25 feet high or whatever it is. Fortunately, we don't have ideal conditions. Um, but they do eat like crazy, uh, and they breed like crazy, and they produce a slime. And they do so for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is to stick to their neighbors so that they can then have a slimy coating around them that prevents the things that eat them or, or hinders the things that eat them from getting in at them. And so you've got this slime layer. Sometimes we call it biofilm in this industry, particularly if you're doing compost tea, that black stuff is biofilm. Uh, and, the, and, and it's anaerobic uh, when it's in a biofilm situation. But in the beginning, these are just, uh, you know, colonies that are coated with this sticky stuff. And, and the sticky stuff is sticky enough so that these colonies not only stick to each other, but they stick to individual particles of soil. And what that means is uh, these particles of soil end up uh, uh, being stuck together with this glue from the biofilm. Uh, and, and that is the beginning of soil structure. Uh, this is what the, what the uh, slime looks like. This is bacteria in slime. Uh, again, the thing that, that, that I use to relate to this, when you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth to get rid of bacterial bio slime. Half of you are now licking your teeth right now. That's what everybody always does. That bio slime is exactly the same bio slime as the bio slime that sticks together these little particles of soil. The bio slime itself has a pH that's above seven. And what that means is if your soil has a dominance of bacteria in it versus fungi, which is the other, other organism that you can get a dominance with, if it has a dominance of bacteria, the pH is gonna be above seven because of the bacteria. The bacteria are what are creating the pH in this kind of a situation. Now, in that teaspoon of soil, you also have 14 feet of invisible fungal hyphae. You can't see it, it's in there, uh, it's weaving through that stuff, and uh, you know, in a, in a good mycorrhizal situation, I'm gonna talk about mycorrhizal fungi, you can have three miles in a little teaspoon of soil. So uh, we don't study fungi in school, uh, I just read an article in the New York Times uh, uh, last week. They're now asking people, you know, let's start studying. They have the same body parts as a plant except chloroplast. They don't have the chlorophyll and chloroplast. They can't make, uh, you know, their own uh, uh, sugars. And uh, they, they uh, operate almost exactly the same way as plants with one or two big differences. Along their cell wall, instead of uh, 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 cellulose, they have chitin, which is the same thing that's in crabs and lobsters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they digest extracellularly. So they, they put stuff out into the soil and digest out in the soil. I'll talk about that in a quick minute. But these guys move by bringing up stuff from the back of the fungi. Their cytoplasm moves up all the particles they need up into the tip. They open up the tip, sort of like you can imagine taking a brick out and quickly add in more bricks so that they can move forward without leaking all the stuff out that's inside the thing. They're fascinating organisms, and that's why I ended up writing the third book, actually, because they're so interesting and we don't study them. And they weave together and go through those stuck-together bacterial particles. And so, again, you get more soil structure. Those weave-together particles, you know, the bacterial bricks, so to speak, are not flat. They're irregular. And so you end up with something that has pore spaces where the little guys can hide from the bigger guys, where when it rains, the bad air gets pushed out, uh, good air gets pulled in behind it, reservoir space for water. This is soil structure comes from bacteria and fungi. And who knew? Nobody. Okay, so they drip out acids in order to digest food, and then they take the digested food into their system 
uh, through, their, through their, uh, uh, their wall, which is a chitin wall. They leave the acids in the soil. Now, these acids break down hard to digest things like, you know, lignin and, and stuff. So making it edges available to bacteria and they leave this stuff in the soil. So as the fungi continues to move on, there's still decay going on and still breakdown going on as a result of the fungi having been there. Uh, they are absolutely spectacular, wonderfully fun organisms. If this acid can be very, very strong, is very strong, this is uh, fungal hyphae going into felspar rock and breaking it down. So, you know, it's very strong stuff, and it's an acid, and so acids have a pH below 7. And we'll talk a little bit about that again uh, in, a, in a minute or two. Now, there's some really special fungi that are att attracted, and these are the mycorrhizal fungi. Now, notice I didn't say mycorrhizae fungi. I said mycorrhizal fungi. Don't say mycorrhizae unless you mean the root and the fungus. That's the mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizal fungus partners with the root to form a mycorrhizae. Are the great white shark guys here? They told me they were going to change their label because it says mycorrhizae down at the bottom of it. But uh, I, I, you know, I bug people all the time. I bug people about fulvic acids, humic acids. There is no such thing as humic acid. It's with an S always, so I'm, I'm an obnoxious son of a bitch, I, I apologize. <laughs> All right, so the mycorrhizal fungi, in return for those exudates, go out into the soil, because the plant says, you want more exudates, you go get me something. And they go out in the soil and they get phosphorus, and they get zinc, uh, they get uh, you know, nitrogen, copper, you can read as well as I can, and they bring this back to the plant in return for exudates. 96% of the plants on the planet Earth have this relationship with a fungus. It's a symbiotic relationship. The ones that don't are generally in the brassica family, cabbages and things your kids don't like to eat. Um, and the uh, uh, importance of them cannot be overstressed. And cannabis forms a mycorrhizae, and you need to make sure that it's able to do so. And we'll talk about that as well. So here's how they operate. So we got two seedlings. These are two cannabis seedlings. You know, one of them is organic, one of them is chemical. And they're sitting in the beach, and the organic one goes, geez, I, am, I would love a bologna sandwich. And so what does it do? It, it goes and mixes up the right extra dates, right? Make, makes the right extra dates. Uh, no, no uncomplex thing, I might add. And then it puts the extra dates in, into the soil. And the next thing you know, it catches what it needs, the right mycorrhizal fungi. And the mycorrhizal fungi gets the signal from the plant. The plant signals the mycorrhizal fungi, OK? It's not the other way around. And so you've got to have a healthy living plant in order to have mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and you don't in compost because you don't have a live plant in compost. So there's no mycorrhizal fungi in compost. Uh, so the, the other end of the fungus goes out and finds the baloney and brings it back. So let's take a look at that. There's the root. There's the fungi going in there. It's a hell of a picture, actually. And the fungus goes out, and it finds the baloney. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> you know, it finds the baloney, and it says, which one of these guys am I going to take the baloney from? Uh, but it's the same baloney anyway. It doesn't make a bit of difference. So the fungus brings the baloney back uh, and uh, feeds it to the plant. Okay? And lo and behold, as a result of getting the baloney, the plant grows. <laughs> Terrific. And because it's a symbiotic relationship and the plant says thank you very much and gives more exudates to the plant, to the fungus, the fungus stays there and continues to grow itself. And it grows and grows and grows. And what's really cool is if you've got two plants next to each other in the same vicinity, even if they don't happen to be the same species, lo and behold, they will share their goodies between each other. You know, which you think, wow, what good does that make? Who cares, you know? Well, I don't know. You know, kind of nice that these guys are sharing, isn't it? You know, you happen to miss an area with fertilizer, and all of a sudden the thing continues to grow nicely because it's getting fed the same stuff as a result of the mycorrhizal network that exists. And there is a network throughout your soil, and you don't want to disturb that network. You don't want to rototill. You really don't want to take a rake. If you're going indoors, you don't want to take a, you know, you don't want to break that soil up. The least amount of damage you can do to your soil, the least disturbance to your soil is going to end up with the least amount of damage to these mycorrhizal fungi. 
All right. Now, there's seven different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi that we know of. Orchids won't even germinate unless they have their own mycorrhizal fungi uh, right there. Uh, but the one that we're interested in is known as an endomycorrhizal fungi, as opposed to the other big group, which is called an ectomycorrhizal fungi. And just quickly, ectomycorrhizal fungi, you can see with the naked eye, they have fruiting bodies that mushrooms, you were eating, you know, mycorrhizal, they have mushrooms or uh, uh, truffles, you know, and they're big and you can see them with a naked eye. You can see the fungus itself with a naked eye. Endomycorrhizal fungi, unfortunately, you can't see with a naked eye, so you're going to have to just believe me that they're there. Uh, endo, of course, means in. Uh, if in, they're in that, they're there, although you don't, you can't see it because you've got to stain them in order to be able to see them. And when you stain them, they look like this inside the plant. Uh, those little round things uh, are where the interface takes place between the fungus and the plant and where the transfers take place. Uh, it's in between the cells. It's not in a cell. It grows in between the cells and the, it forms this invagination. And then if that's even the right word, don't even look it up. Uh, and, and you get this little round thing. Those round things, incidentally, are capable of being converted into spores. So when you chop this guy up, even though there may be no spores there, it'll multiply. You create what's known as a propagule. And when you look at the label, it says X amount of propagules per whatever. Uh, that's what a propagule is. So they, you got to stain them. It's a pain in the butt to do. Really, I don't advise that people do it. It's not, not really that safe. The product is not that good. And you end up with these two basic structures. That's the ves vesicle, and it's called vesicular, and that's a, a tree-like structure it's called, uh, called an arbuscular, so it's a secular, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and they're really quite beautiful. Uh, and, 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 and it turns out that in the cannabis growing field, you really only need to know about one. There are about 350 so that we've been able to identify, we, like I'm an identifier, that have been identified, um, uh, but there are only about 15 that can be duplicated in the lab. And it wasn't until recently that they were able to do that. People are always trying to, to, to grow more, but fortunately, these 15 sleep around. And so they'll sleep with different plants. Uh, and, and, and we've identified the one that sleeps with cannabis. And the unfortunate problem is that over the years, several different names have been applied to this. Okay, so you'll see on labels, Rhizophagus irrigale, you see Glomus, uh, you see all sorts of different names. But in the past year or so, as a result of DNA, we now have an official name, uh, and right now it happens to be Rhizophagus interacetes. That is the only mycorrhizal fungi that associates with cannabis. Now, why would you want to buy more mycorrhizal fungi, uh, you know, when you're growing cannabis? You probably wouldn't. Simple as that. Uh, if, if you buy one that has all 15 mycorrhizal fungi in it that we know how to make, you're wasting your time. Now, you might want a couple of other ones if you determine that they feed your cover crop, if you're using a cover crop. Um, but other than that, this is the only one you need. And it's probably sold under the name of Glomus right now. Glomus interacetes or Glomus mossy. Um, but this is the proper name, and these are the other names that you might potentially see. You know, I don't generally tell people to take pictures of a slide, but that may be one you want to take a picture of, because these things work. How do I know they work? Because I've tested them. Um, I've tested them a lot, actually. Uh, and they're really kind of fun. Again, that's what you want right there. Uh, how do you apply them? You apply them as early as possible. You roll your seeds in them. You mix the stuff in your soil so that the roots grow into it. Uh, you want to have infection as early as possible because you want these things to start operating as quickly as possible. Uh, when you transplant your plant, you roll your transplants in or you powder on some of the powder on it uh, because they have to come into contact with the root so that the root can put the signal out uh, and you do it at transplanting time uh, and man, it makes a big difference. And you mix it into your soil so that the roots grow into the mycorrhizal fungi and form new colonies, if that's the proper word. Uh, um, and it's, it's, it's really an unbelievable thing. So what, I say, you know, you say. Uh, well, you know, you get big plants sometimes. 
uh, if the genetics are proper. We were talking in the car, you know, genetics are number one. To me, soil is number two. Uh, and you can use mycorrhizal fungi in soil and get some very nice looking plants. Um, I don't know the variety of this particular plant. This was the first time I ever tested mycorrhizal fungi on cannabis, the right one. Uh, and I'm trying to show you how large these leaves were because I was pissing in my pants as I watched this thing grow. Now, I live in Anchorage, Alaska, and you're really only allowed to have six plants. Okay, I had 12. Um, <laughs> But I was testing other stuff, and, and uh, you know, so I, I, I really got the stuff late in the season, like, you know, early in the season, but I had already started plants. So I only tested one plant, one plant. That's my head behind that plant. Eh, he's faking it. He's got the, all right. This is a frying pan, a big frying pan, okay? Like a frying pan you'd use on a, uh, a trail ride. You know what I mean? A big frying pan. That's a big leaf. Okay. That's my book, okay? You know, look at the different, look at this. Anybody grow leaves that big on a normal basis? I never had. Oh, I was so excited. My wife said, shut up, you know. Well, it turned out to be a male plant. Ugh. So we're gonna be trying that again. The, the, the variety happened to be something called uh, Wow, Wallace Wow Mycorrhizal. The guy's a giant pumpkin grower. Uh, and man, oh man, I can see why. Uh, here's the other thing about this stuff. Not only can you grow bigger plants and more healthy plants, uh, but these, th this particular fungi produces an exudate of its own. And this exudate is known as glomalin. That's how I pronounce it. Other people pronounce it differently. The glomalin, you can't see. You've got to stain it to this be able to see it. This stuff gives a rigidity to these really fragile, floppy pieces of spaghetti hyphae. And so it's really good stuff in that regard. Uh, these things also ha tend to have, you know, it's got to be solidified a little bit, pulled together, and they often have gaps which are sealed by this stuff. You use much less fertilizer because the fungi are going out and getting it and bringing it back to your plant. Uh, you end up with better roots because it changes the morphology of how roots are developed on the plant. You use much less water for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is these things bring water back to the plant. Wow, bring water back to the plant, that's pretty cool. And uh, those little vesicles, they contain liquid water. And so if you're in a bad drought situation or you happen to just, uh-oh, you don't get home in time, you know, that is where water goes into the plant. It's in a perfect location. This is uh, Illinois three or four years ago and there was a terrible drought. If you applied it, you got a crop, corn. If you didn't, you got a dead crop, simple as that. Um, they also act as sort of protection, not sort of protection, protection. Nematodes do not like to eat chitin, and these fungi are covered with chitin, so the nematodes, nematodes go away. Uh, they're just, they're terrific. And in some instances, not this particular fungi, you get, you get that kind of stuff on the, on the end, ecto, and you can't even get in at the root, so uh, it's really important. All right, now remember I talked about the slime having a pH you know, above seven alkaline, uh, the fungal enzymes are acids. So the pH is below seven, and the same thing applies. If you have fungally dominated soil, your soil is going to be acidic. And we all know that the pH of the soil has a lot to do with how the nutrients react with each other. So this is important stuff to understand where it comes from because you can adjust it yourself and you can change it. Uh, these enzymes are very, very strong, and, and uh, so that, that, that it's a very important thing to keep an eye on. So here's what's really going on in the soil. You know, you've got these, these uh, uh, wonderful bacteria and fungi, and along come the nematodes and the amoebas. They eat them, they poop it out, and they feed the plant. So, uh, you know, I, uh, all this poop, incidentally, comes out as ammonia. All of it, always, okay? And the difference is, and the reason why I pointed out the fungal dominated versus bacterially dominated is because if, it stay, if it's fungally dominated, you have ammonium and very, very few, if any, nitrogen fixing bacteria that would convert that ammonium into nitrate. If the pH is above seven, you have nitrogen fixing bacteria because they like to live in a pH above seven and you end up having the nitrates produced. So the, the two different kinds of nitrogen are based upon uh, whether it's bacterially dominated or fungally dominated, your soils. And you probably have no idea whether your soils are fungally dominated or bacterially dominated. You need to test to find that out. 
Uh, and once you test it, then you can pretty well figure out what's going on. Now, so what about cannabis? Where is cannabis in the grand scheme of things? Well, cannabis is an annual, and plants that are in the ground less than a year like pH is above seven. They like bacterially dominated soil. Stuff that's in the ground for more than a year, for those of you that are landscape architects that are around here, I think there are a couple of, they like fungally dominated soil. The old growth forest is 50,000 fungus to every bacteria. 50,000 to one. The beach is 50,000 bacteria to probably no fungus. So you need to find where along that continuum from old growth you know, to the beginning of life, where does cannabis belong? And fortunately, I hear that Dr. Elaine Ingham, that wonderful person, has done a lot of work in this area. And the number that was quoted to me was a ratio of 0.6 to 1. Either 0.6 up to 1. So you know, one fungus per one bacteria. And, and uh, you know, that's a pretty doable thing, which you can do. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to do it. But cannabis is an annual. And it likes the, the bacterially dominated soil. All right, so if you want bacterially dominated soil, uh, you know, in your compost piles and in your compost teas, these are the things that you would use. Uh, and, and, and they foster bacterial. Um, you can uh, put uh, cover crops in that also produce nitrogen uh, as well. Uh, and foster that uh, key. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that would produce fungus. They like the humic acids. They like soybean meal. Uh, uh, so when you're making compost teas and you're doing these things, these are the things you're going to like. All right, so the bacteria and the fungi, which I've just talked about, I call them the fertilizer bags. That's the fertilizer bags. You want to have lots and lots and lots of them because that's what gets eaten and pooped out. And so they're fertilizer bags. What spreads the fertilizer are the protozoa and the nematodes. They're the fertilizer spreaders. Let's talk a little bit about them. So this is an amoeba, which everybody said they saw in high school, but nobody ever really did. Uh, and they're really spectacular organisms. If you do see one, uh, they're all over the place, and they eat all sorts of stuff, and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're easy. This is the paramecium, which you all studied in high school, took a diagram home. Uh, you know, and ask your mother and father to help you, uh, and it looked like the bottom of your shoe and had a little gullet in it, and you had to, you know, label the thing and then bring it in. And nobody ever knew why we looked at these things. We didn't, we didn't study bacteria because they were too small. We studied these because they were big enough to see and they were harmless. Uh, but nobody ever had any thoughts about what, what good they were. But these little guys, this is what they look like today under an electron microscope, these little guys will eat 10,000 bacterium a day, each one of them, and poop out all 10,000 of them. So you want to have a lot of them in the soil. Uh, and generally in that teaspoon, you've got a couple of thousand of them. And in fact, you can grow your own and add them to the soil by simply taking straw or tall grass or hay, putting it in a bucket of water and stirring it to keep oxygen in it, uh, maybe two or three times a day. After two or three days, you'll look in that stuff. You'll see these things darting around like crazy. You put that stuff on your plants, and in 10 days, they're in that rhizosphere, eating and pooping their hearts out. What a great thing. Uh, and you studied them in high school, and Mrs. Fisher had no idea that you would one day you know, actually use the knowledge. So uh, that's what the diagram looked like, uh, in case you didn't do your homework. Uh, and protozoic tea, tea kits is what I, what I talk about. Um, and it's really unbelievable. You will be surprised. Uh, they're really kind of fun. Um, nematodes, there should be 40 to 50 of them in a good teaspoon of soil. M there are, you know, five or six of them that generally are in soil, and maybe one or two of them are bad. The other ones are beneficial. Um, so, you know, but they don't like the chitin. Uh, they do get into their or the organism that they're attacking. Uh, they'll lay eggs. They bring bacteria in with them. Uh, the bacteria act as food. Uh, for the babies, the babies eat the bacteria, but then when they're ready to leave, they bring a little bit of the bacterium with them in order to be able to repeat the process. And of course, you don't want to see this because this is the result of the bad nematodes on cannabis. So you want to be, want to be careful about that. They all have different mouth parts, and that's what distinguishes them. They're true worms. They have a mouth and an anus and digestive systems. It's the mouth parts that distinguish them. Um, and again, you should have about 40 or 50 of them, and about 20 of them ought to be bacterial eaters. The other ones ought to be fungal eaters. Um, 
that one looks like a fungal eater to me. You know, it looks like something I wouldn't want to put my hands in the soil, but in fact, it's a bacterial eater. It's just a rubber spatula waving water into the mouth that contains bacteria. This one, on the other hand, is not one that I want to run into. Uh, that's not, you know, fake. That's not a real nail, but it acts the same way, and it gets pushed into the cytoplasm, and then it sucks out all the good stuff out of stuff. Um, this one attacks dogs, and this one, I think, causes hookworm or something like that. But anyway, they're fascinating organisms, and you can buy good ones that will go out and ambush prey. There has been a tremendous uh, insurgence of people who specialize in beneficials. And if you don't have a company that supplies them in your stable, you need one. And you need to make a good relationship with at least somebody at that company who can help you. Because you can't identify everything that's happening to you, and they probably can. But just to help you, there's another book you need to get. It's by a guy named James Nardi, N-A-R-D-I. It's a book called Life in the Soil, which I was asked to review. And I went, oh, no, they're going to ask me to review a book, and it's going to be the same as my book, and I'm going to have to be nice. Anyway, it turned out not to be like my book. It's an identification book of all the things that are in the soil. And it has a little paragraph under each one, and it tells you what they eat. Well, if you know what the bigger guys eat, you can figure out whether your soils are dominant in bacteria or fungi. Certain things eat fungus. If you have springtails around, you've got fungus all over the place. So you want to know that stuff. James Nardi's book is a, is, is a big help. Uh, and certainly, again, having somebody in your stable who can not only explain to you how these things operate, uh, you know, but can help you is really, really important. Um, of course, you can go and look yourself. Uh, all the shows you know, have this stuff available. There's lots of different companies th that do it, and it's definitely something you want to keep an eye on because new stuff is being developed all the time. All right, um, so these are some of the things you might find that are bigger uh, that eat the littler guys. You know, so you've got a jappy jid. There's the springtail over here. If you've got those in your soil, uh, you know, they're, they're, then you've got fungus. Um, and what you find when you take a look is that predominantly what you'll have are mites all over the place. And there are two kinds of mites. Well, there's three kinds of mites. There's bad mites. <laughs> uh, but then there, there are mites that eat vegetation, and there are mites that eat other critters. And so, you know, you want to know the difference between those and learn that kind of stuff. It is an eat and eat world down there, more soil structure building. Because these guys in larva form are weaving through the soil, creating tunnels. The bad air gets pushed out by good air. When it rains, you get reservoir spaces, places for things to hide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is unbelievable. And you've got life and death constantly, constantly. If they're not trying to screw each other, they're trying to eat each other. And so you've got dead stuff all over the place, which puts carbon into the soil, which then gets eaten by blah, 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 you know, and you end up with a wonderful system. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, if you take something known as a brulee funnel, you can see this is just out of a regular batch of soil out of my garden. Holy crow, you know. Uh, and you get the orbited and you get the gamacid. The gamacid is the one that eats the other organisms. This is the evil rove beetle, which I always stick in here. If you're either a quasi-hydroponic or hydroponic, uh, these little beetles here, man, oh man, oh man, do they eat stuff like crazy. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't taken out Karl Rove yet, but... Um, they are really unbelievable uh, organisms. So uh, then you get the bigger guys. You know, we all know what bears do in the woods, right? This is my house in Anchorage, Alaska. I, I'm sorry, I apologize for those who've seen this about 15 times. That was where my head was. You see the little crease over there? When my wife heard me go, oh, what the? And I jumped up, because I heard this heavy breathing, and I wasn't watching pornography. And uh, <laughs> you know, when I look at the picture, I realize that window is open. That's a screen right there, uh, and there was that bear watching the same television set I was. Uh, you know, fortunately, when this guy came, the window was closed, because you never know what you're going to see outside a window in Anchorage, Alaska. You see all sorts of stuff. One time last spring, when I was just walking through the room, I looked out the window, and I saw a pair of palins. <laughs> Give the whole talk just for that slide, I might have. Uh, you know, and she was a lot scarier, they were a lot scarier than the wolf that I saw later on. But anyway, um, we do lots of crazy things to these organisms in the soil food web, whether they're big or whether they're small. 
uh, and, and, you know, really destructive things like rototilling. Rototilling is a stupid thing to do because it breaks up everything in the soil food web. The worms that you cut in half with that rototiller don't turn into two worms uh, unless you hit the 18 segment, in which case one half lives. But what are the chances of that? Uh, the bacteria that are supposed to be here end up down there. That fungal network, which is putting out that wonderful exudate, the exudate of the fungus, um, glomalin, is destroyed. So it's not putting out that glomalin. Here's the thing about that glomalin. That glomalin is where the carbon comes from in your soil. When we talk about global warming, those idiots in Washington, D.C. have no idea that when they rototill their garden, that they're causing a serious problem for us. That carbon is what we need. And it comes not from humic acids. Maybe 13% of the carbon in your soil comes from humic acids. 27 to 37% of the carbon in your soil comes from these mycorrhizal fungi, and they pump it out into the soil every minute of the day. So you want to keep them living all the time. You want them pumping out carbon into your soil all the time. Because at the bottom of the soil food web, carbon. Carbon is the energy source that runs all of us and runs the soil food web. So, uh, you know, you don't want to rototill um, and, and you don't want to, you certainly don't want to, uh, you know, do it on a large scale basis. Everybody says, well, how do I plant? My God, you know, they don't call it weed for nothing, for one thing. And for seconds, We've all seen plants grow through pavement, grow through cement. They don't need you to rototill and pulverize. The reason we do it is because there was a lawyer back in the time of Jefferson and Washington, uh, uh, and he believed, like everybody else, he was English, he believed that plants ate food. It's called the humus theory. Plants ate food. So rototill it up, he said. Pulverize it so the plants don't have to chew so much. Huh? And we still wrote it till today for the very same reason, because Thomas Jefferson and, and John Adams, who was a farmer, you know, these were big time, and George Washington read this guy. And it became de rigueur in America to roto till. And we wrote it till because of this silly guy back in the 1700s. Unbelievable. Um, so not a good thing to do, uh, even in pots. Uh, you know, you just plant regularly. And then we use chemicals. We use these terrible chemicals. I don't have to tell this group how bad they are. They're awful. Uh, you know, we don't really understand how they work. Uh, my God, if we do understand how they work, we haven't been told. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just unbelievable the fact that we are all sitting here right now. Every single one of us has one thing in common. One thing in common. Roundup. Every one of us has glyphosate in our blood system. Did anybody here voluntarily eat glyphosate? Don't think so. Whew. So that alone ought to be the reason. Uh, you know, then we do stupid things like this. You know, how many of your employees suit up, put on the gas mask, do all the stuff that's required? If no one's looking, no one's protecting. That's generally the rule. And that's not good for the employee. Forget the plant for a second. Uh, and then, of course, as I said at the very beginning, think about the consumer, ultimately environmental perspective, but from the plant's perspective, even worse. Because here's what happens. You don't get nitrogen fixation. Why? Because if you're feeding the plant chemicals, the plant says, what the heck am I producing these exudates for? I'm using 60% of my energy. I could clearly avoid doing that. You're feeding me all this great stuff, not the soil food web. Because you become the soil food web. You're the base of the soil food web. If you're feeding your plants chemicals, you end up with no mycorrhizal partnership. Why does a plant need to spend the energy to feed a mycorrhizal fungi if you're feeding it? Now again, we think plants are stupid, you know, because they don't talk, they don't walk, they don't run. They're very smart and they know how to save energy and they'll do it in a nanosecond because that's what they do. And so you end up with 96% uh, of the plants end up not having a, a mycorrhizal relationship, no glomalin, no carbon, none of these nutrients. Phosphorus, nitrogen, holy crow, this is important stuff, and yet most people in the world have no idea mycorrhizal fungi even exist, nonetheless that chemicals can impact them in a neg negative uh, situation. So really important. Dependency and disease, all these things uh, happen as a result, and you know, you end up with some pretty bad situations. 
and yet it's so easy to fix or to prevent. You either keep the microbes there or you put the microbes back in again if you've got a ruined system. And how do you do that? Well, it couldn't be any easier. The first thing you do is you can use compost because compost is phenomenal stuff, and I'll explain why in a minute. You can use compost teas, both of which can be made fungally or bacterially dominated, or you can use mulches, and if you don't have mycorrhizal fungi, you can add them as well. So that's the fourth thing. Compost. Compost contains all of the fertilizer bags and all of the fertilizer spreaders you could possibly want. If you've good compost, and of course, who here makes bad compost? We all make good compost, and if you don't, you need to learn how to make good compost because it's terrific stuff. You don't have to put very much of it on, just a little bit, and it goes down. The microbiology works its way into the root zone, into the soil, and you're happy as clams. Now, there are some problems with compost. The first is you've got to have a spouse that's willing to turn your pile, uh, or you've got to have a really good source, uh, and you've got to know what goes into your compost. Because if you're using compost that has manure in it from an animal that's been treated with tetracycline and the composting process misses just a little bit of it, that tetracycline gets out of the leaf of the plant and ends up into your customer. You don't want that happening. And other stuff, worse. So you got to know where your compost comes from and what's in it. Um, and and, and it's, it's terrific stuff once you, once you figure that all out. You can adjust it by adding more woody stuff. There are all sorts of formulas to make it more fungal. It's not difficult to do. Compost teas. Now, compost teas are very, very controversial outside of this industry. And why are they controversial? Because the Cooperative Extension Service hates it. And why do they hate it? Because there was a lady involved with them who hates Dr. Elaine Ingham. They had a fight. They didn't get along. And so the Cooperative Extension Service isn't even allowed to talk about compost teas in most places. Um, and yet, this happens to be the proof of proof, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm a little prejudiced because I went there. That's the president of Harvard University. She's looking at T. Fleischer, who did his master's uh, report on compost tea using the Harvard Yard. And lo and behold, it was so successful that they now own probably a dozen machines. The entire campus worldwide is compost teed. That's how they maintain it. And when you park your car in Harvard Yard, you're parking your car in a compost yard. I mean, a compost teed yard, which is simply unbelievable. Um, it's just absolutely incredible to me. Boulder uses it. University of Colorado uses it. University of Arizona, New York Botanical Garden, Portland Zoo, all sorts of places. But the Cooperative Extension Service will tell you it doesn't work. I had a conversation with, with Tate, I guess I, he's not here. You know, here's the bottom line on compost tea. People say it doesn't work because you're not putting in the right microbes. You're just putting in compost microbes and it doesn't work. If that's true, What's happening is you're putting in compost and nutrients that you've brewed and you've increased the amount of microbes. You're putting it down in the soil, and if it's dying, it becomes food for the soil food web that's there. So if nothing else, you're adding nutrient source and biomass into the system to increase the biomass. But I happen to believe it works, because it does work. Uh, we've all used it, or I've used it for years and years and years. I've tested it versus not versus. I'm sorry if Cornell University isn't capable of getting the results that I get. Just using cilantro, the difference is phenomenal in the two weeks. The so it works. And it, if anybody says it doesn't work, you say, well, okay, Harvard University is using it. If it's good enough for Harvard, it's good enough for little old me. That's what I like to say. So there are lots of different compost tea brewers. You guys all know about it. I won't stress too much on it. Uh, a lot of people are now, instead of doing compost tea, doing compost extracts. I know that there's an effort now not to use the word pot. That's a fine word. Marijuana is a racist word. We need to stop using it. We need to go to the state of Alaska, which has a Marijuana Control Act, and change the word. Anyway, I just, so that's why I use cannabis, and we all ought to use cannabis. It should be a standard. Let the pharmaceutical people talk about marijuana. So you want to have mulches, you want to mulch your soil, period. And, and, and again, we're, we're talking about a, an annual plant, so the kind of mulch you want is the mulch that feeds bacteria primarily. You've got to have a little bit of fungi, and they'll be there by... So the rule is this. Brown is for fungal, and green is for bacteria. So I, I use grass clippings on mine. I might put a couple of, you know, birch leaves in that I find around out in the area, but I use grass clippings. You can use alfalfa meal. Uh, you know, 
don't have bare soil. Doesn't have to be thick, but gee, if nothing else, at that interface, which everybody always says, oh, God, you know, you're losing all the nitrogen. Nah, you're getting great microbial life there, right there at the surface. Why waste that surface for, if it did nothing else, but it does lots of other stuff. So, so that's what you want. That's the, uh, the rule. And the end game is to increase the microbial biomass. You want to have microbes all over the place, dying because they're being eaten and pooped out. Producing hormones like crazy and killing off the bad guys, you know, screwing each other and multiplying, providing this wonderful organic biomass, which holds the nutrients that you put down. Unlike liquids, which these nutrients are in the bodies of all of these wonderful organisms. So they, they hold the nutrient, and the higher the microbial biomass, the better your grow is going to be. And I stick this in here because Zach is here. Where are you, Zach? Okay, everybody turn around and look at Zach right now, and then write this down, www.microbiometer.com, microbiometer.com, because this is a new system that was invented by a woman named Judith Fitzpatrick, probably, well, probably about six or seven years ago, that measures microbial biomass. And what does that mean? Well, first of all, that means if you buy compost, you can test it and you can tell whether it's good or not. Does it have a high microbial biomass or a low one? What we need to be doing, and it started already and you can all be helped, it turns out that the biomass changes in the rhizosphere as various things happen in the plant. Right before it flowers, the plant says, why the hell do I need all these bacteria right now? I'm flowering, man. I need a little bit of boron and get going, but I don't need all this other stuff. And so it cuts down on the exudate, and the biomass right in that area drops. Holy crow, if you can tell that a couple of days ahead of time, you know what to do next, you know? Oh, you can tell when your plant might be ready. We don't know. We're going to do all these tests, and you're going to do tests. Everybody, it's a brand new thing, so that we can tell, based on the numbers and the trending of the numbers, what's going to be happening to our plant. So we can test the medium that we put the plant in, and we can test the products that people sell us. So for example, somebody in here gave me a product, I tested it, my God, this stuff teems with microbes, I said. And it suddenly occurred to me that as a result of this biometer, we all now have a tool that in the field for five or 10 bucks or 15 bucks, right away in five minutes, can tell us whether we're teeming with microbes. That is an unbelievable thing to me. And it should be an unbelievable thing, I hope, for everybody else. And I predict that this is going to become a USDA standard. You know, just like NPK. You know, you send your stuff in and you get the NPK results. Well, you'll get your NPK results and your biomass numbers. And until that happens, we'll have to take them ourselves. So that's, that's, that's the beauty of that. Uh, information is power. You also want to do a soil food web test. Not every time, but you want to know. You know, what's going on? So you've got to have information. Data is power, really key stuff. OK, um, you want to use the soil food web as much as possible. This is the guts here, you know. So you want to use the mulches and the compost, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi incident that you add, as, as you can probably imagine. Uh, that's the one you have to use. Incidentally, that's a picture of it with its spores. Isn't that a gorgeous looking thing? Um, and again, all of this stuff helps to make that big, fat microbial biomass that you want to have. All right. so. You know, that's sort, of, that's sort of how the soil food web works in a sense, but, but you got to also know a little bit about the nutrients and the chemistry and how that all plays together. And I don't have to, I give a whole separate talk on that, but I want to just stick a little bit of it in here, uh, you know, because you got you to know how this stuff gets in the plant. It's important to understand this for two reasons. One is when you figure out how the stuff gets into the plant and what it does inside the plant, then you have a completely different appreciation for your plant, what you're doing to your plant, and what your plant's doing for you. There are so many myths that have developed as a result of our lack of knowledge about how plants eat and what they do with the food, you know, that we end up doing things that probably we don't need to do. <clears throat> and I maintain that if you read Teeming with Nutrients and supplementary stuff, you'll figure out you don't need to flush. Complete waste of time because it doesn't work molecularly and biologically. It doesn't make any sense in terms of how that cell operates, you know, and how that trichome gets formed. 
Flushing is not going to help. It's a stupid thing. I've come to the conclusion as a result of understanding a little bit about the chemistry. So, you know, now I've got a couple of things to say about chemistry, first of all. I would have been a doctor today had it not been for the methyl ethyl chicken wire organic chemistry course that I was forced to take and didn't do very well in. And so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is what I think of chemistry. Uh, but you've got to know a little bit about chemistry, okay? But you don't have to know everything it's because plants only need four, uh, let's see, 17 nutrients, right? 17. So that's not a lot of chemical uh, elements to understand. 17. That's all it requires. You, you know, I, I always tell people, the rest of the stuff, and again, I don't mean to be sexist, it's just filler. 17 is what you need. That stuff, the 56 elements that are in kelp, they're not feeding your plant. They're feeding microbes. They may contain hormone, you know, gibberellic acid and things like that, but they're not feeding your plant. It's not plant food. So it's kind of interesting. You only need these 17, uh, you know, the, you know what they are. Uh, you can't play cards with 17. Cards. I mean, how, how, you know, how could 17 elements produce everything that's your plant? And essentially everything that's you, because you're eating plants to become you. Holy crap. I like to say, that cow is not a vegetarian. Uh, well, no, you're not a vegetarian, but that the, the cow you ate or the steer you ate was. You know? uh, and so you take these 17 nutrients and you figure out the combinations that you can make, because these are, you know, and you end up with, holy crow, uh, you mix them together, something like 25 trillion different molecules that you can make. And I don't have the number here because for some reason it's not here. But 95% of the weight of that plant are those three, C, H, and O. And you're not really normally supplying the C, H, and O. Most of the C, H, and O would get, those are the same thing that's in beer, which is why it's so important. But, um, you know, you're getting the CO2 and the O2. H2O, you know, most of it's coming in automatically, not by you. So 95% of the plants just happening. Not, you don't need to do it, it's just happening. Wow, okay, so I only got to deal with 5%. Yeah, and that's where, that's where the work needs to take place. And by the way, C and H make terpenes. And, you know, I always hear people say, oh, I got this stuff. You put it in the soil, you know, and it goes into the plant and it makes the terpenes better. Well, it's the chemistry inside the plant that's making the terpenes better. You, nothing, no terpene is traveling into that, into the, you know, it's, it's C and H, and it's, you know, it's how they, it all works. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and so in order to understand why you wouldn't flush, again, you have to understand how the, the cells work uh, and how these things interact amongst themselves. So the 5% of the 14 uh, mineral nutrients, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's what you pay attention to. Now, how does this stuff get in the plant, you know? That's, that's sort of what people, people need, to, need to understand. So you've got your basic cell, right? It's got a cell wall around the whole cell. Right inside that cell wall, something called a plasma lemma. Now, you may know about it, but as I sat down to write this book, God, I realized how stupid I am. Never heard of a plasma lemma. A plasma lemma is just like your television screen. It's a true plasma. You know, when you touch your t television screen, you drag your finger across it, it gets staticky, and you can see it. It's a plasma, like fire is a plasma, okay? You know, that blue, and, and so that, this plasma, which looks like this, it surrounds the entire cell, every single cell in the plant, and it's got this, this, this unbelievable property because inside the plasma are these individual proteins that float around in it. So there they are, they're floating around in it, and these individual proteins are tunnels that allow individual nutrients to enter into the cell, and there's also a plasma lemma around the vacuole of the middle of the cell, and also to let them in there. And if, if it doesn't fit these, it doesn't get in. And it turns out that each one of these is different for each different nutrient. So you don't get, uh, you know, uh, boron into the wrong carrier. It has to go into the right one. And each one of these proteins is made by the cell and inserted into it. And sometimes they only use these tunnels for five or six molecules. Boron again comes to mind. You only need it during flowering, a little bit during cell. Very few just go through. All the energy to make that protein, to stick it in here. Wow. But nothing gets in unless it goes through there, except for water, which can, can slip through. Uh, I think carbon dioxide can slip through. But the nutrients that we care about, those 5%, come through these tunnels. That's how they get in. 
and terpenes don't fit through these tunnels, period. So, uh, and this is the, this is, you know, you can see the different stuff, you can read it well as I can, but there's the vacuole has the same thing, this wonderful thing. And that's what controls what goes inside and out of the plant. Uh, and in order to be able to get through those tunnels, you'll notice you have to have an electric charge because they operate as a result of different, you know, the electrons pulling on each other. Sometimes they have a carrier that pulls them through. But they, all of these nutrients, except occasionally boron, have either a positive or negative charge. All of them. And what puts the positive or negative charge on it? The microbes. The microbes take organic, inorganic, eat it, poop it out, it's got the charge on it. So what you're doing is you're feeding microbes. You're not feeding the plant, the microbes are feeding the plant. Um, and this is, this is uh, you know, the, the things, and there's the ions, that's how they're absorbed, uh, and, and that's what you've got to pay attention to. NPK, you've got to do an NPK test too. Lots of people don't. And sometimes you want to do a tissue test also, see what's taken up, you know. So you've got to test data, 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 data. Um, and then you've got to appreciate and understand the size of things. We're dealing down in the nanometer section, way down here, you know. Not millimeters, which is dime size. We're dealing in really teeny stuff. We're dealing with individual cells. And you're treating individual cells. And as each one of these cells grow, they're very small. If something goes wrong, that cell doesn't develop right, you know, things get screwed up in your plant. So in an individual, oh, well, here's a statistic that I always find interesting. If each one of us was a nanometer tall, the entire population of the world, 6.5 billion people, could fit into that little seed packet right there. You know? So we're talking teeny, teeny sized stuff, but that doesn't mean that it isn't important stuff. Because even though it's small, you can screw it up like you can't believe. I mean, we are talking unbelievably <laughs> small. Okay? Yeah, I don't know why I stuck this in here, but I had to do it. Um, you're a jerk. Sorry. In the period at the end of a sentence in any of one of my books, there are five to 50 plant cells. The atoms in each one of the cells, that's how many atoms are in the cell. And in a normal plant, uh, you know, there's probably 18 trillion cells. Holy crow. So you're dealing with some really small things. Each one is a little factory. And what goes on in these cells is absolutely unbelievable. And each one is connected to the other one. So that if you went into the root system, you got into a cell, you've gone through the cell wall, you're in the cell. You could go from one cell to another cell without ever leaving the cytoplasm. So what you really got is a super nucleated organism like a beehive. Because each individual cell is really not alive. It takes the whole plant to reproduce, just like a beehive. And these cells work with each other. And you've got to treat them right in order to, to, to have them operate right. You've got to appreciate their size in order to understand and appreciate what they do so that you can treat them properly. For example, in every one of those 18 trillion cells, there happen to be 42 million proteins in each cell. A number they just came up with last week, I might add, so you're the first that I've talked to about. There's a second, I guess. but uh, So you've got unbelievable amounts of protein. So you wonder why amino acids work when you put them in, you know, because they got the building blocks that end up, wow. Um, and, and, and it turns out that there's special protein, one of which happens to be enzymes. So in each individual cell, of which there are 18 trillion, you should have about 1,000 different enzymes and 10,000 members of each group. That's a lot of enzymes operating in there. And if you don't have that member, number of enzymes in every cell, your plant's not chugging along at the right time. And so it helps to understand that these enzymes work best at these temperatures that we grow our plants. So that's why when you grow your plant at 90 degrees, they don't do well. Or when the plant is too low, they don't. The best temperature is right there, 76 to 80 or so. Man, that's because the enzymes work best and operate the chemical system at its supreme spot. So uh, understanding what goes on in that individual cell, and again, uh, just touched the surface. I gave a whole talk just on, on how these things work. is simply incredible. So, so for example, most of the growth occurs at night. That's why you turn your lights off. 
You know, everybody goes, oh, yeah, it was Anchorage, Alaska, it was a 24-hour sunlight, it were big plants. No, the plants need some nighttime in order to be able to simulate and put the stuff together. You know, the only reason why we grow big cabbages in Alaska, or big pumpkins now, we weren't able to do, is because of the soil. The Alaska Yuma soil that's in the area where they traditionally grew the cabbages for the state fair is the richest soil on the face of the earth. It has the highest microbiology of any soil on the face of the earth that has been tested, as far as I know. And sure, it's right there in a the six-inch layer, and it grows the big, pump, the big uh, cabbages. I live in Anchorage, Alaska, which is 30 minutes away. And up until three or four years ago, nobody in Anchorage, Alaska could grow a big cabbage. And everywhere I go, they go, oh, that's because of the sunlight. It's the sunlight. Wait a minute, I'm 30 minutes away. I have the same sunlight they have where they grow these big, in Palmer, where, where they grow the big uh, cabbages. Well, what we, what we discovered and we thought, well, it's, it's not the sunlight, obviously. What is it? It's got to be the soil. It's got to be this Alaska humus stuff. And sure enough, when we started growing cabbages in Alaska humus, bringing it into Anchorage, it gets removed in Anchorage because it's 80 feet thick. So they take it off to build on. It's a, you know, geo it's a geo seismic problem, and they put it in the landfill. You can't ever touch it again. But if you get some of it, and you grow a cabbage in it, holy crow. And the same thing with cannabis and everything else. So these pumpkins grow 40 pounds at night sometimes. Your cannabis is growing at night. You've got to appreciate how that cell operates, what's going on in that cell. Uh, and again, I'm just, I just scratched the surface. I hardly, I hardly touch it. Uh, you know, so you got to just understand what's going on. You know what I mean? Uh, you got to got to pay attention. Uh, you know, and you got to react properly, uh, particularly when you're dealing with things that are so small. You make a little mistake when they're small, it gets tough for the thing to get big. Um, so uh, that's it. So uh, the, you know, the rest of this stuff may seem pretty obvious, uh, but I think it's pretty important stuff. Uh, you want to start with the very best soil you can. Genetics first, soil second, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you need light and water and all that other stuff, you know. But if you've got great soil with great microbiology, what do you guys call it? Living soil, which is not a phrase I particularly like. Because from my perspective, all soil is living. Dirt is dead. But anyway, we'll use living soil. You want to have the most living soil you possibly can. Simple as that. And how do you get the most living soil you possibly can? Well, one of the things you do is you create a situation where that soil becomes not only a condominium for microbes, but a really fancy, fancy first-class condominium. For me. So you put stuff in there you know, that makes it as good as possible, biochar. The reason why biochar works is because it's a condominium for microbes. You can't use just pure biochar. You have to recharge, you have to charge it. Why? Because you've got to fill that condominium up, otherwise it's just an empty condominium and it isn't doing you any good whatsoever. So you want to have the best condominium, and the best condominium means soil, the best you can have, period. Don't skimp on soil or genetics. You want to keep the pests under control. In order to keep the pests under control, you have to think like a soil food webby. If you're organic, you're a soil food webby, uh, and you know you, you can add organisms that consume, outcompete, interfere, and reduce the pest. Okay, simple as that. Uh, you want to prevent things like this. You got to think like a soil food webby. What is the pest? So you got to be able to identify it. And if you can't identify it, and you know right now whether you're going to be capable of identifying it, find somebody who does know how to identify pests. And find them before you get the pests. Because it's too late when the guy says, or the lady, I'll see you in about a week. I'm pretty busy. No. You want to know instantly. You want to develop that relationship. You want to know where the eggs are laid. You can read as well as I can, but these are the questions you need to ask yourself. They're very obvious questions. When you get the answers to these questions, then you can know what to do. Where do you get to the answer to these questions? You use your computer. The best thing a cannabis grower ever, ever got was the internet. Google is information. Bing, duck, duck, go, whatever it happens to be. My goodness gracious. If I had a dime for every time my wife asked me a question, and I had to explain to her the difference between where I went to school and where she went to school, where, where I went to school, they said, Look it up. Well, now you can look it up anywhere, and you should. Uh, and, and so that's important. So, you know, you need to learn some of this stuff. And if you don't want to learn it, you've got to get somebody in there to get it. So these guys are all good stuff, and you can buy them now. Um, you know, that's a gamut. That's a gamut, said for sure. Um, and they're beautiful, and they operate terrific. And you can get these things going. They're sort of like your, you know, these are like your, your shepherd, your dogs. 
that are running around keeping your herd you know, in context and in control and keeping the wolves away and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is all key stuff. Uh, you know, so it depends on when, where's the leaf? What's going on in the plant? How old is the plant? What, 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 when do I put on what, where, what, et cetera, et cetera? Again, I won't go into this stuff. Uh, you know, these things can attract stuff away from your plant. I have a friend who has banana plants in the middle of his grow, and the banana plants attract all sorts of things that don't get on the regular cannabis plants. Whew, pretty cool. Uh, you want to you put your traps in the right place, for God's sakes. Just because people have pictures of them hanging up at the top, right? You know what I'm talking about. That's not where the pests are, they're down by the... All right, uh, you know, this is, this is that rove beetle. Boy, you put this rove beetle in a water situation, it sits down on the roots, you know, like a, uh, an aquaponic situation, or something, and man, it sees something move out of the... Phenomenal, great stuff. Uh, you know, rove is a bastard, and rove beetles are just as tough, I have to say. Um, you know, there's all sorts of stuff you can use, uh, and, and it's all very, 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 very important. Uh, the one thing that I, that I really haven't talked about is the light is also important. And I, is Sen here? What is it? Oh, yeah, Kit, Kit's here. Right? Okay, you're there. So I've asked a, a guy and gal uh, who have a company that make, uh, uh, produce, or, or lease out a brand new kind of light called a plasma light. And this plasma light, we think, has an impact on the microbiology. Why? Because this plasma light is like sun. It's used by NASA, you know, to be sun. Uh, when you look at the, when you look at the uh, UV that comes out of it, it's, it matches the sun or it's better than the sun. LEDs don't do that. It, you know, the HID, they don't do that. They don't reproduce the sunlight. And so the microbes are not living in natural conditions if you're growing with those. So this is going to be new technology that, that has been improved because when it first came out, you couldn't, use it, you couldn't use it for flowering. Now you can use it for everything. You know, all of these things are available and usable indoors and outdoors. Um, you know, and again, you've got that paramecium tea, uh, which you can use. Uh, you want to use cover crops? Makes a lot of sense to use cover crops. Not only do they attract some of the bad guys, if there are, uh, but they pump in nitrogen. They, they put biomass into the soil because they're putting out exudates. And by the way, if you end up with a male plant, you know, that male plant is still putting out exudates, attracting all the microbes that it needs. That soil that you have in that male plant's great. Cut the male plant off, plant right in it. The new plant grows in, down the roots of the old plant that are dead. The microbes use a lot of that material that's dead because it's decaying and feeding. Whew, makes it easier for it to grow. The water ends up down in that area. Uh, and you've got all these exudates for a cannabis plant that's been put into the, into the soil. Why are you throwing that away? Just because you're scared of a couple of men. You know, simple as that. Anyway, uh, you want to you build a microbial biomass. Uh, or leave it in, as, as you do in that particular instance. You want to use compost, you want to use compost teas, you know, all this stuff makes a point. Here's the male plant, you know. Literally, I simply cut it, replant. In fact, when I harvest, I, I, I've been growing now in the same pots, I guess, four years. I'm getting pretty stoned, you know, with what I'm growing, uh, so it's certainly working. Uh, you don't have to switch soil every darn grow. What a waste. And if you do, you put it into a compost pile, you recondition it, you reuse it again. My goodness gracious. You know, we've got to do it the right way. Let the pharma companies, you know, the bad guys, waste the money. We're not going to do that. Particularly when you think about the fact that we're ending, you know, we keep hearing terror, 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 you know. Even if you're growing in a pot, you know, well, you create your own when you start recycling your soil constantly, and you, that's your terroir, you know, if that's the proper way to pronounce it. Um, you want to test, test, test. I cannot stress this enough. You know, in fact, I got one slide in here someplace. You want to do soil food web, you want to do microbiome, you want to do NPK, you know, you want to test. Information is power, and what this says is you're stupid if you don't test. Simple as that. You're stupid. A terrible word to use. You've got to test, folks. Information is power. You know, you do it for your own health. You got to do it for plants' health. It's just so important. Um, you know, and this stuff that I'm talking about, it works indoors just as well as it works outdoors. The plant doesn't care where it is. It wants a good, viable, hardworking soil food web, whether it's indoors or outdoors. 
its last choice is miracle Grow. you know what I'm saying? It wants what it normally, normally gets. All right, so, uh, you know, again, I've already mentioned this. This is your best friend, guys. Use it all the time. There's no stupid questions when you ask Google a question. You know, it doesn't laugh at you. It gives you an answer. And if it doesn't give you an answer, then you can go other places. And here's the deal. We have this information anytime we want and any place we want it. Don't wait. Get the answer right away because you're dealing with 18 trillion cells. You want to fix them right away. They're going to get away from you if you wait 24 hours, if you wait till you go home. You're carrying your phone around. I know you are. I know when, you know, when Rudy's not looking. <laughs> You're on that day. So, you know, use it. It's very, very important. And get familiar with the places to look. You know, there's certain ones that, that are there. All right, so here's how I end it. Not convinced, think about this. Just think about this. You know those redwoods? They're growing out there. They're like 750 years old. Some of them are 500 feet tall. How the hell did they get that big without any miracle grow, without any pesticides placed on it? They got that big because even though they're that big, they teemed with these teeny, teeny little microbes. And that is what makes plants grow. And that's what makes amazing cannabis. Thank you very much. You're a terrific audience. And, and how about a hand for Verdi Natural? Yeah, all right. Thank you so much. Give it up for Jeff. And now uh, I would like to invite Cassandra Maffi, the master grower of Verde and the mastermind behind the method that we use. Woo! Cassandra taught the entire team at Verde how to grow in living soil. And we are very, very, very grateful for that. And I also I would love to invite Jamie Hubbard, uh, the cultivation manager at Verde. Um, give it up for Jamie. And uh, whoever would like to ask questions. Well, you know, it doesn't really just, it doesn't tear it up the way, you know, there's plenty of area that's not destroyed. If you need to disturb the soil, you disturb it the least amount as possible. Aeration happens to be something that helps fungi in particular. They're the first things to go when, when ground is compressed. Not really a problem I don't think you have with counters because you're not walking around your plants very much, so I don't think you really have to worry about it. That's the answer to that one. Yeah. And, I would like to ask Cassandra to elaborate a little bit on that because in our garden we do it a little different ah. so I would love to hear your opinion on that. Me too. <laughs> well, um, so, you know, so whenever I have grown cannabis outdoors and when I allow for a natural season, um, I love cover cropping and I think the no-till approach is really always the right approach for outdoor cultivation. A fair day, and, and I honor really both. I've seen like amazing no-till growers. I think the important thing is, is just to rely on the soil food web and to feed that wherever possible. Um, at Verde, because we're constantly turning over our, our soil garden, essentially what we take out is the root mass, which is pretty much just a solid brick by the time we, we pull it out. Um, so there's no room. So there's no, yeah, so there's no room in there. Essentially, we're taking out a footprint of a three, uh, a three gallon pot and then we're putting one back in. But we also till in some uh, kelp meal, mm -hmm. dolomite lime and mm -hmm. things like that. And so it's sort of a process of like re-inoculation each time. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that those nutrients break down very quickly to give access to plants just because it's so high intensity. Sure, sure. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, and, and it makes a difference, you know, when you're using organic, it takes longer to break the stuff down, so, yeah. Thank you. Please, go ahead. Um, 
So what we do, um, first thing when we harvest is we go ahead and pull the root balls, which again are essentially just like three gallon footprint bricks of root mass. Um, you see roots like travel the length of our, our 12 foot beds. But in any case, we're taking like the bulk of just that root mass and then we send that to be composted. And we do an NPK test. Uh, the microbiometer is a wonderful tool that we've started using as well. Um, and then we're, you know, we're also testing the pH. We're just kind of getting a sense for where we're at. And then we'll add new material in like granulated kelp meal, um, granular humic acids, um, that sort of thing. And um, a lot of organic alfalfa meal as well. And so we're just basically adding in some food and that's what we're, what we're using instead of any bottled nutrients. When we use bottled nutrients, it's, it's just a very small quantity. I know a number of growers that take the roots, they don't listen to me, they take the roots, indoor growers, and they pulverize the roots up and literally use that as sort of a mulch. Kind of interesting because again, it's got all the carbon in it, it's got, it's got you know, some mycorrhizal fungi in it probably, so it's, that's another thing you can that's potentially really do with cool. it. But yeah. composting, when you compost stuff, you can use one quarter of the fertilizer you would put on directly on a plant in the compost pile and use that compost. You don't have to use the 100% that you would use on a plant. So putting stuff in a compost pile always makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, if, if for no other reason, again, that the microbes are holding all the nutrients that you created as a result of that stuff. Yeah. We'll go back there. Um, so there's a lot of plans for compost tea brewers to step online. Is there any schematics for that uh, exact The one they use is called a geo brewer, and uh, the 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 basic, of course, is that you know syrup cart that you can get anywhere in the world. That's why he designed it that way. But the thing itself sort of looks like an outboard motor kind of deal, and you can see pictures of it. And it's, you you could duplicate it, but whew, you know this is all stainless steel designed so that it doesn't have any corners. It gets bio slime. So yeah, but yeah, there are pictures of it. It's called the the geo. So, yeah. And Jeff, do you think that the pump matters in a compost tea brewer? What, like what? Vortex is really into yeah. a less I, abrasive. I like Vortex. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, you're, you're growing bacteria, you're growing fungi and multiplying bacteria, and the fungi are, are fragile. That nice Vortexy, you know, biodynamic kind of, you know, it's it's got a good feel to it. The, that geo brewer makes a little roll like this one. Yeah, I do think it makes it. I know it makes a difference because I, again, I explained the, the talk this, this afternoon. I spent probably about a year and a half or two years almost on a weekly basis sending samples into Dr. Elaine Ingham. And I was testing all sorts of different brewer designs and all, you know, and she would write me back and say, what the hell did you just do? Your taste is terrible, you know. And, and so, yeah, it does make a big difference. Big difference. I, I like the vortex quite a bit. Are there uh, fungal biomass tests like this? Uh, not that I know of, uh, but I, I know that the woman who invented the, the microbiometer is working on one, uh, because I keep bugging her about, let's get one that does fungi. <laughs> yeah. um, but but you, can, you can often tell whether you've got good fungi by inoculating your compost and, and trying to grow the fungi yourself. So, you know, we talk, we talk about uh, taking a handful of baby oatmeal, a handful of your compost, mixing it up, putting it in a dark room, you know, and, and growing the Santa's beard. If it doesn't grow the Santa's beard, you know, so you can grow the fungus to a certain extent. Thanks. But it depends on what you feed it, so that's the problem. And in the soil food web tests that right. you get, right. and do we send that to you? Or? No, no, soil food web tests, you know, they go to the soil food web labs, um, and there's different soil food lab labs in the country and as well as around the world, and, and that'll tell you exactly what you got. But it takes, you know, it takes a little bit of time to do it. And so that, that's always the big problem. Do you have the time? And again, you know, as everybody knows, if you can plan ahead of time, it makes sense. You start with your compost six months before you're screwing around with your plants. And that way you can do the testing and get all the information you need ahead of time, right? We have, we have time for two more questions. Right? Well, I don't know if we agree on this, but if you have if you have too much trichoderma, 
uh, they eat the fungus. So and, the and they'll eat the mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. Now, how much is too much? Good question. Timing is, the key, I think, right? Timing is the key, and that's often why it's nice to have separate, you know, not everything mixed together in that regard, so you can put them on separately when you want to. Um, yeah, the mycorrhizae take a while to grow. And so if you kill them off, you know, they may not grow in, in time to really be doing what you really want them to do. So you got to be careful using trichoderma. I'm not saying don't use it. You just have to be careful and use it when you, at the right time. So, Do you agree? Or? No, I agree, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the main, the trichoderma that we use is primarily to stave off um, powdery mildew. Right. You so, know. so you don't use it all the time. I mean, and that's a foliar application. Go ahead. Yep. Um, I'm curious about uh, like indigenous microorganisms, like working with like box or whatever. Um, is there specific areas that you have found to be more successful for specific like, cannabis? First of all, how do they relate to the 500 that, that they just discovered? That's the first thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming you're not talking about EM. You're talking about indigenous organisms in the soil. And should you use compost from your own area? Should you bring compost in from another area? You know, well, if, they, if, if all these plants have the 500, pretty key, huh? You know, I mean, it doesn't make any difference, perhaps. Whereas maybe last week I would have said, yeah, it probably, it probably does make a difference. Um, but now I'm not so sure, because these 500 should be there. Uh, and we know those 500 are everywhere where plants grow. So um, I'm not sure what the answer really is. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I can tell you that, that we have shipped Alaska humus around the country, around the world for that matter, don't tell the, don't, don't tell, uh, the border controls. Um, um, and, and it works wherever you ship it, so, that, so it definitely, you can have compost from other areas that work. The question is, are you introducing something you don't want to introduce? And, and I've never heard anybody that has introduced something that they don't want to introduce uh, from a microbiological perspective in terms of compost. So it probably doesn't make a difference, particularly, again, with this 500. But again, I don't know whether you have a thought on it or not. That's too advanced a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to thank you so much for coming tonight. I want to uh, thank again Jeff for giving such an amazing presentation. <laughs> You know, I think that uh, people that are that passionate and can explain such complicated topics with simple words, to me, represent truth. You know, and we have something here together that we're all seeking in cultivating this plant. And so we would love to continue to provide an environment where we can get together, learn together, and actually Enjoy also like-minded people. Thank Cassandra, thanks Jamie, and the entire team of Verde.